Hey, everybody. Welcome back to The Contrarians. Welcome to another panel discussion we have tonight. Um, we have a really knowledgeable and great group of guys tonight. Um, and we have a pretty special topic. Uh, tonight, we're going to be talking about our favorite record producers. So we're going to go around and each person's going to give maybe their top one or two and then some honorable mentions about what record producers they've picked what albums by that record producer that they like, uh, what about that record producer style they like, and kind of just have a general discussion about why they're picking the record producer that they're, they're picking. Um, this conversation was um, suggested in our Patreon channel, and it was voted on by our wonderful patrons. If you want to join any of these conversations, join us at Patreon uh, at any tier. Some tiers give you access to suggesting topics and voting um, but every tier will get you a chance to get on one of these discussions to chat. Um, other than that, we also have a Ko-Fi for anybody who wants to uh, support the channel without having to subscribe on a monthly basis. And we also have our Tee Public. So over there, you can get t-shirts like, like the one Grant's repping tonight. Um, but yeah, other than that, we've got a great group of guys. And I'm really excited to hear which record producers each person is going to pick and why. So why don't we start with Joe? I'm going to throw it over to Joe. Let us know who you're picking and... Uh, if you have any honorable mentions or anything. I'll start with my honorable mentions, Brendan O'Brien and Bob Rock. But my number one absolute, I am a total geek for this producer. And it, it, I, I, I finally realized that about five years ago, I was taking an Uber into Manhattan and I had my headphones on, which I usually don't do because I like to be around my surroundings. And I'm listening to Fastway. And uh, all I need, your love comes on. And I'm like, I friggin' love Eddie Kramer. I just, I am a geek for Eddie Kramer. Kiss Alive is my all-time favorite album. It's the reason, I, you know, I, I say it every time, reason I like hard rock and metal, that and Aerosmith rocks. But uh, yeah, everything he does, uh, Ace Frehley's solo album, Kiss Alive, Foghat, Stone Blue. Sorry, Martin, but my favorite Angel album is On Earth As It Is In Heaven. I friggin' love that album. I listen to it constantly. I think... Uh, can you feel it has one of the greatest guitar solos of all time? Cause Eddie has, you can hear punky meadows hit actually hit the strings. Uh, I even like anthrax among the living. I know Scott Ian had a lot of problems with that, but yeah, I am a, Oh, side four of alive two is incredible. Um, I'm a geek for Eddie Kramer. I, some people don't like the snare sound. I, I don't know it probably because that it was my introduction into metal and rock, but uh, I, if for some reason, it just really hit me when I was listening to that Fast Way album. I'm like, he's, I just love it. And then, you know, he did work on Led Zeppelin. He was an engineer for Led Zeppelin's best albums, too, uh, namely Physical Graffiti. So, yeah, Eddie Kramer's my guy. I'm a geek for Eddie Kramer. I wish he produced every album. So that's that's all I got. Yeah, and he produced the uh, the first demo with those five songs on it that later ended up on the yeah. first album, except for Watching You, I think, was on the second album. Right. That and, demo, and, was, that, that would be like my favorite Kiss releases, that demo, I think. Those five and songs. And thank God, thank God that Eddie Kramer met Yumi Hendrix. There you like go. Like Ladyland, yeah, absolutely. That studio, legendary studio. Yeah, yeah. Incredible. And all the recordings from the uh, All You Experienced and, and Access Wellness Love was done with Eddie Kramer. Awesome. Are you going, so going with God Eddie Kramer too, Pontus? No, but I, I love that guy. <laughs> what, so what that, is it? One more. Martin, man, it, I, I, mean, I know it, but you slag on, on Earth as it is in heaven, but I absolutely love that album. So There's nothing wrong with that record. <laughs> right. why, don't, uh, why don't you go next, Pontus? Oh, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm really surrounded by this guy because recently we've been talking about Deep Purple and uh, I've been going through that and realized they had a house producer engineer and that is called Martin Birch. Um, and I love his production, the way he actually listened to the band and then just went for it as an engineer. And he co-produced, he, he, he worked with a lot of, uh, I mean, he worked um, on many, many, many things, but you mean, I can see, yeah, see if you can see that. Um, yeah. Deep Purple New Rock, for starters, Machine Head. Here, yeah. um, we have Made in Japan. I mean, what a sound that guy had, you know? Just, 
it's just magical that he just recorded that in Japan and didn't get a signal out. He didn't see. He couldn't see that he was recording. <laughs> so, so when he went home, he just checked the tapes, and it was just wonderful. And, of course, he w- made one of the best ever, ever hard rock albums ever made, Rising. And he worked with White Snake, and he worked with Sabbath, and Blue Oyster Cult and all that. And Maiden, of course. You know, he were you know, he was so essential when it came to giving hard rock its sound. And it's it, those albums stand up very high today. So Martin Birch is my pick. You had a few uh, honorable mentions too. Did you want to rattle them off real quick? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um let, let's talk about another interesting guy, Jimmy Miller. Jimmy Miller produces uh, the first three or four um, traffic albums. Then he goes and produces uh, Blind Faith for Clapton and Winwood and Baker. And then he moves on to Stones. And I mean, it's 50 years now. Uh, for Exile on Main Street. And his his thing was that he was very rootsy. He was a very rootsy. He he brought the best out of the Stones from Jumping Jack Flash to It's Only Rock and Roll. It's him. And as a cool thing, he then, you know, living with the Stones was quite hard. So he was off the off the map for a few years, and then he goes back and produces Motorhead, just to prove that you know, Stone was bad enough. <laughs> just this spot on guy who just this just does this fine. Rootsy Productions, and I love that. So right. that's my honorable mention. And let's not forget, he produced the Plasmatics, too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Thanks, Pontus. Uh, we don't have Martin, but we have his twin. Uh, why don't you take it away, Todd? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I'll take that as a compliment. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about a gentleman named Dave Allen, sometimes uh, referred to as David M. Allen. Uh, he worked between 1982 and 1989, which is not a very long time, but he's probably best known for co-producing with Robert Smith five Cure albums, all the ones from the top through uh, Wish. So the top there and Head on the Door and uh, Kiss Me, Kiss Me, Kiss Me. Uh, There's the masterpiece right there. Yeah, which some cartoon characters call the best album of all time. And uh, Wish, which is my, which is one of my favorites as well. And um, he also produced uh, the Sisters of Mercy, first and last and always. And uh, this incredible album that Martin talked about on uh, Sea of Tranquility, The Chameleon UK or The Chameleons, uh, Strange Times. Um, one of my favorite albums of all time. Um, and um, he uh, also produced some things that I haven't heard. He's produced a, an album by The Damned, uh, an album called Not of This Earth. He produced uh, two albums for The Mission. And um, one of my favorite albums that I don't have a physical copy of it, but uh, it's uh, Book of Days by the Psychedelic Furs. And with them, he kind of took them away from the big drum uh, sound of the 80s and took them back into the more murky, mysterious kind of a, of a sound that they were known for prior to that. Um, his uh, productions are really thick and dense and lush, but they're also kind of minimalist in a, in a strange kind of way. But uh, by saying minimalist and saying that, that they're thick and dense, they're not without detail. Like some of these uh, Cure albums have some acoustic moments on them where they do sparkle a little bit, even though they're really uh, still mostly kind of dark. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I cannot, I could not find anything that he produced after, uh, the psychedelic first book of days, which is in 1989, but, uh, those cure albums, uh, I, uh, 
the cure have a lot of good albums after that period and they've got a lot of great songs after that period but they never sounded quite right to me after that and uh <laughs> and nope. so uh so i picked dave allen um i was going to change this into an honorable mention but i'm going to talk about him a little bit uh david kirsten bomb uh worked between 75 and 93 uh started out as a recording artist uh, he was an executive at AM electra and capital um, he signed Janet Jackson and Joe Jackson, no relation <laughs> to uh, A&M. And uh, he's, it was his idea to hook up Brian Adams to uh, Bob Clearmountain for, you know, some whole bunch of successful records after that. Um, he's uh, known to me as the person who produced uh, Joe Jackson. He signed Joe Jackson, uh, produced a bunch of Joe Jackson albums, uh, Michael favorites these two right here uh, body and soul and big world um and uh this super tramp album which i think is way underrated right, right, right. uh yeah. brother will you bound 1985 and his stuff is uh really it was also i wanted to mention this too it was also his idea to 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 remix all the duran duran songs on rio and he put them he put them out as a as a uh 12, a bunch of 12 inch singles, but he also made a, uh, uh, an EP called Carnival and, um, Duran Duran was not doing well and the label wasn't happy and the band wasn't happy. And until Kirschenbaum decided to market them as a dance band instead of a new or new romantic band, that was when Duran Duran took off. Um, he also produced Tracy Chapman's first two records and, uh, oh. and, uh, so when you talk about what his productions are like, they're really smooth and detailed audio file quality uh big drum sound without a being a gimmicky drum sound it's just loud but it's not really got a lot of effects on it um he's quoted as saying sometimes the best production is no production and um, if you think about those tracy chapman albums that's pretty accurate uh i think this is one of the best sounding albums of all time really cool album uh looks like a classic blue note album on the back um this Joe Jackson album was uh, recorded live, direct to two track, and with in front of an audience. They told the audience to be quiet for the minute preceding and after each track, and uh, I thought that was pretty cool. Not the best sounding Joe Jackson album, but definitely a novel approach. Uh, but uh, for honorable mentions, I'm going to pick uh, Martin Birch, and I decided not to pick Martin Birch because I figured that somebody else on the panel would and do a better job than I would, and that was true, Pontus. <laughs> and um, so I decided since there are still lots of Martin Birch records that I haven't heard yet, I would let somebody else tackle that one. Nice. Good job, Todd. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to throw it over to Rand, who's in California right now catching some suns, some sunbeams. Hello. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's nice. It's 62 outside and the wind's blowing and the sun's shining. Um, I'll make this quick. Uh, oh, yeah. 1967. Find me another album that sounds as good as this in 1967. Mm -hmm. Pepper? Well, it's the same guy. I know. I met a different producer than George Martin. Oh, in 67? <laughs> Yeah, uh, uh, Piper at the Gates of Dawn, and that was Norman Smith. That sounds that's pretty much home. It's all Abbey yeah. Road, yeah. Um, well, anyways, this was like my favorite band in the world, still is, and I think George Martin is just incredible. He also went on to uh, produce Jeff Beck and the Ma Vishnu Orchestra. And then, oh, my second guy would be don't forget UFO. Yeah, all oh, right, right. No place to run. I never heard that. Uh, this album, to me, is the greatest album ever made. Sports, the greatest song ever written and recorded and performed. Um, Eddie Offord, this this cat. I don't know if he's on. Yeah, he's right here. Eddie Offord, whatever. And uh, real quick, Ken Scott, Happy the Man, Crafty Hands. He also did Super Tramp, Crime of the Century, and he did uh, My Vision Orchestra, Birds of Fire. And then this, Stephen Wilson, In Absentia, Porcupine Tree. This guy is just Mr. 5.1 surround sound. 
And um, my honorable mention would be Alan Parsons. Yeah, Eddie Alford also did those Emerson, Lake, and Palmer albums, which yeah, co-produced with Ray Flick. Mm -hmm. uh, From '66, that sounds just as good. Go ahead. <laughs> oh yeah, same Rebel guy. Rebel. <laughs> same guy. And it has it. I no, you're it, right. Uh, Revolver has a pristine sound. It, yeah, it's unbelievable. Yeah, for absolutely. 66. Compare that. Compare that to yeah, yeah, Frank Zappa's yeah, yeah. freak absolutely. out. Absolutely. Just for sound. Absolutely. I mean, um, and you have Ken Scott worked for uh, George Martin. Norman Smith worked for George Martin. And Alan Parsons know, it's, it's worked fun. for George Martin. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. He's all over what the Get Back movie. Oh, yeah. He's sitting back there. You the, see him the, everywhere. He's always, bored. Yeah. He's always yeah. running tapes. And, running and he looks real around. young. Thanks, Rand. Awesome. Good pick. Um, right. I'm going to throw it over to Ryan next. Why don't you tell us who your favorite producer is? All right. Um, hey, guys. So I had a really hard time with this just because there was a few people that I had in mind. I'm going to start with my couple honorable mentions. Um, I'm not really going to go into details about them, but I had Roy Thomas Baker, um, Eddie Kramer, Brian Eno, Robert Fripp, and Niles Rogers. Um, so, but for my actual pick, I'm going to talk about Jack Douglas, um, obviously of like cheap trick Aerosmith fame, some John Lennon to some engineering Isles Cooper records and production also, um, you know, starting with Alice Cooper, he did production on muscle of love, which is a pretty good album. I don't think it's his best production of all time but it's a very solid one um and before that he had even done some engineering for john lennon on imagine um he did some engineering on yoko ono's second album fly which is a very strange album i wouldn't say it's like a great production but it's an interesting one um you know, he did engineering also on Billion Dollar Babies, which is one of Alice Cooper's best records of all time. Um, and so then he kind of got into a relationship with a band that ended up being his most prolific. You know, he ended up becoming known as the sixth member of this band, and that's Aerosmith. Um, he did engineering on Get Your Wings and Honestly, it seems like he basically did production too. He doesn't really get the credit for it, but it definitely sounds like a Jack Douglas production more than anything. I think Bob Ezrin had the um, production credit on that, and it definitely sounds a lot better than anything Bob Ezrin would have ever done. Um, I think that the story is that uh, Ezrin was supposed to do that album, and that's why Dick Wagner plays lead on Train Up the Rollin'. But mm -hmm. Aerosmith hated Ezrin, which led him to Jack Douglas. They just hated working with him. It worked out. <laughs> um, and then, yes, yeah, so then you have like Poison the Attic, which is another masterpiece of an album. Sounds amazing. Um, Rocks, which is another one that I absolutely love. It's one of my top Aerosmith albums. Um, my favorite Aerosmith album, Draw the Line. You know, that album gets some crap from some circles. I think it's one of the greatest hard rock albums of all time. It's so raw, energetic, big sounding, and just nasty. I mean, it's not like the most polished recording of all time, not the most polished production, but I, what I love about those jack douglas productions especially also the album i'm going to talk about next is that he just let bands be dangerous it's kind of like eddie kramer also that's why i thought of him you know he just made the band sound so much raw or let them be the best they could sound in like terms of hard rock because they were so nasty sounding and so yeah draw the line probably in my top 10 albums of all time but another, probably my favorite production that he ever did, and it actually sounds really good too, even though it's super raw, is Cheap Trick's first album. Um, you know, this album is just brilliant. It sounds way ahead of its time, um, sound-wise. It's the rawest they ever sounded, the most brutal they ever sounded. 
And I mean, the only thing that you really need to know with this album, like how important Jack Douglas was to the band is listen to In Color with Tom Werman. He neutered that band. And, you know, Heaven Tonight, Uh he kind of let them come back a little bit. Like, I like In Color. It's a really good album, but it's not the same band by any means. And then Heaven Tonight, they got a little rawer again, a little heavier, but still not there. And then At Budokan comes out, which was self-produced. But Jack I thought Doug- that was Jack Douglas. Oh, sorry. He did the mixing on that one. I clarified. But he that. mixed it. Yeah, he mixed it, and it sounds so much better than in color. <laughs> um, and, you know, Tom, Tom Mormon's a good producer. He did some of those early Ted Nugent albums and stuff. But I just think that for the band that Cheap Trick was, Jack Douglas – made them sound the best they ever were and they had some really good albums after that including a really good one produced by roy thomas baker one-on-one i like the sound on that quite a bit um and you know you have dream police and stuff too which is a really good album i mean they have brilliant stuff but for me the best will always be the debut album and also Jack Douglas was the executive producer on this EP, Found All Parts, which I actually happen to like quite a bit too. It's pretty great sounding. Um, And, you know, obviously, uh, Obviously. Jack later on did stuff like Double Fantasy too, which is a pretty cool album. It's not my favorite John Lennon album, but it is a very good sounding album. Um, you know, he had a ton of other credits too, like Artful Dodger and stuff, but those are kind of like the highlights for me, the stuff he did with Aerosmith, which also includes in the eighties rock in a hard place, which is a really good album. And then later on honking with Bobo, which is not great. But... You know, I'm glad you brought that up. Cause one of my biggest disappointments was that music from another dimension, which is a horrible album. And they, you know, they're bringing them on. They're saying they're going to recreate Toys in the Attic. And I, got, I just had a feeling that Steven, because they, I think they list Jack Douglas, Steven Tyler, and Marty Fredrickson or something. I, I feel like they didn't let Jack Douglas really produce that album. And that's why it's such crap. I think it was more Steven Tyler's project. But. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So, I mean, stuff he did early on with Aerosmith, that first Cheap Trick record, and i mean some of the stuff with that he did with john lennon and alice cooper you know just an amazing small amount of work um of like big stuff oh also he did stars which is really good stuff too first album violation and I, he was a production assistant on coliseum rock which isn't their best but still so um yeah a lot of great stuff from him really raw producer let bands be loud let them be dangerous and a lot of the times the best they ever sounded i and i remember buying that debut album by uh cheap trick when i was in high school i must have been in ninth grade and i remember expecting it not to be good because i didn't know any of the songs and it ended up being my favorite one yeah i mean same i had heard a lot you know of like tom Worman produced songs i'm like this is okay it's not great but it's okay like And then I hear that first album, I'm just like, holy crap, this is amazing. You know, a a fun fact with that first Cheap Trick album is Nikki Six admits that Too Fast for Love, he basically ripped off He's a Whore. And if you listen to it, it's the same song. Wow. Well, I'm sure Nikki ripped off a lot of people. Oh, yeah, he did. He did. (laughs) Horrible stuff. Good pick, Ryan. I'm going to throw it over to Grant. Once Grant's done, I actually have a very interesting question I want to ask everybody. So okay. go ahead, Grant, and then I've well, I'm probably going to piss off some people. And it's good Martin's not here because he would hate this, and Ryan's not going to like it either. But uh, my choice, okay, I was going to go with my first pick is Tom Worman, but I was. Appreciate that. Ryan took care of Jack Douglas for me. So I'm going with Tom Worman. Now, Tom Worman did Blue Oyster Cult, Mother's Finest, Molly Hatchet, Motley Crue, Twisted Sister, Striper, Hawks, Kicks, LA Guns, Poison. 
in addition to key recordings by Doc and Gary Myrick and the Figures, which is great. Uh, Glass Tiger, Jason and the Scorchers, Crocus, the list goes on and on. Mm. But the one I'm going to concentrate on, I haven't heard all of Tom Worman's work. But what I've heard, you know, like Ted Nugent sounds great. Martin doesn't like Tom Worman. And the three albums that he did by Cheap Trick are absolutely brilliant, Ryan. Absolutely brilliant. He took what Jack Douglas had pretty much, okay, Jack Douglas pretty much captured them in the raw feel like a live band. Tom Warman took it to a next step. He gave a little bit more production. We got some strings, we got keyboards. The songs are better. I mean, Heaven Tonight is a brilliant freaking album. And Tom, the work that he did with Cheap Trick, Cheap Trick never ever sounded or did as great of a record since him. Uh, they eventually went and uh, used George Martin, which all shook up's fine. But I remember like in middle school or when that came out, when I heard that, I went, oh my God, what has happened? It was just, it, I think now it's aged better, but I thought, oh boy, they've jumped the shark with all shook up. But now I listen to it and, you know, it's got um, the production on it's fine. I mean, there's strings on it. It still has that cheap trick tonality because the problem with cheap trick as they kept going, um, they kind of lost their essence. And I think their true essence is the sound of Rick Nielsen's guitar. You know why Rick Nielsen sounds on Budokan? He has the same tone on the first album and all the worm and stuff and George Martin. But after that, things got a little crazy because once he got to Todd Rundgren, the Todd Rundgren album sounds like Todd. You've got all that crappy ovation acoustic in there. There's no real power anymore. I'm telling you, the Tom Mormon stuff and the Jack Douglas stuff is top notch. Now, mm -hmm thing about jack douglas he did produce the first one and then he got another chance with standing on the edge but he failed listen to the standing on the edge it doesn't like sound like the same band you've got robin zander singing but that rick nielsen guitar tone where is it it sounds like crap and that was probably because tony platt mixed it there's a cd that came out uh i don't know if you guys have this but it's a comp called and i don't have my glasses on so i can't read it you know what i want to see grant go toe-to-toe -to -toe with d snyder because uh, d, d, d snyder d couldn't see it. <laughs> the epic archives it's like the third set in the epic archives and a lot of 70s bands but anyway i would check the cd out or go online on spotify and check it out and listen to the jack douglas mix a little sister the other thing is that Jack Douglas did, which was great. After Tom Peterson left, they did like some demo sessions. They don't really sound like demos, but they're trying to promote some of their songs to other songwriters. So Jack Douglas took him in the studio and they did, that's where they did um, Such a Good Girl, Take Me on Yours, Oh Boy, With the Vocals, Loser, I'm the Man, Born to Race Hell, and Ohm Sweet Ohm. Those are freaking great tracks. And those tracks, some of those are on the box set and then some of them are on here. If they would have taken those tracks and put those out after Peterson left instead of going with George Martin, they might've had five great albums because hmm. all those tracks are perfect. They're all uh, Jack Douglas productions, great stuff. But anyway, <laughs> So I grand. like Tom Warman. I think his stuff's brilliant. And I do like Jack Douglas, except Jack Douglas failed. Grant, do you yeah. know D. Snyder's disdain for Tom Warman? <laughs> well, I, I don't remember it exactly. But he yeah, probably like, tried to make yeah, him work. Yeah. yeah, I would like to see you go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him. It would be a great, great episode. Right. Yeah. I think Tom Warman, was, he knew what he was doing. I mean, Martin doesn't like his production, but I'm telling you, those – Heaven Tonight and Dream Police, the sound on those, they've never sounded like that. I mean, some people say they were too polished, but that's eh, bullshit. I think Martin's full of crap. 
I don't think that heaven. It's a great album. All those albums get five stars wherever you look at a review. Those first four Cheap Trick albums, five stars. None of the other albums get that. I'm just saying, Tom knew what he was doing. I don't think that Heaven Tonight is too polished. I actually really like that album a lot. I think that first album was here in color was not nearly as good for me. It's still a very good album, but it didn't sound nearly as good. And Heaven Tonight's like right there with the first album. It's not quite as good for me, but it's damn near close. And then Dream Police is a little bit below Heaven Tonight for me, but I still really like that one. Right. Just to set the record straight. I don't think Tom Worman's bad. I just think that... No, but I I don't understand where Martin's coming from. I think Martin's nuts. You'll have to ask him. Well, I was hoping he'd be here so we could go toe-to-toe. Everybody did awesome tonight. He uh, just likes my favorite uh, Angel album. Which you can see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we could pile on to him today, but... <laughs> Man, we'll do a panel discussion but I just don't just everybody I just, Martin. I just don't know why Martin is against Tom Worman. I don't see any problem with his productions. But he's not here to defend himself. So <laughs> uh everybody did amazing tonight. I have a question. Out of all the artists, who do you think were the best at self-producing? Hmm. Well, so there's a lot of a lot of a well, lot Todd of Todd uh, Rundgren, bands, obviously. Yeah, a lot of bands self-produced, uh, especially later on. A lot of bands mm-hmm. are self-producing. I mean, yes. Uh, I'm gonna say Kevin Cronin and, and Gary Richrath when they took over production for Ario Speedwagon, when they did you can can't you can tune a piano, but you can't tune a fish, everything turned around because they started producing themselves. I mean, it made a big difference, and they had hits, and they did High Infidelity with Kevin Beamish. I mean, not that I don't know if anybody likes Aria Speedwag, but I'm just saying, once they took over production, it did make a difference. All right, so... The first album is good. I'd have to argue, I mean, technically Led Zeppelin. I mean, I know Eddie Kramer's the the engineer, but But, Jimmy Page is listed as the producer. Yeah, I would agree with with that. Jimmy Page, brilliant. All these... I mean, we were talking about this in the Animalize uh, episode that we did. Frank Zappa. Yeah. Frank Zappa. And And Ian Anderson. Robert Fripp. Robert Robert Fripp produced that Daryl Hall Hall album. He produced Peter Gabriel, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was going to say... I was going to say King Crimson, because they get the production credit on a lot of their albums. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was just listening last night to their album Lark's Tongues and Aspic from 1973. I have to say that is probably the best sounding prog album of the 70s. It's so big sounding. It sounds like easily like it could be something that came out of the late 90s or 2000s. Like it's so loud, heavy, and just brilliantly produced. I mean, Robert Fripp probably had a lot to do with that but it's just perfect it's my fav- it's my absolute favorite king crimson album i've got the box set i bought all the box sets that king crimson produced all seven of them oh. and uh it cost me a fortune you know probably two thousand dollars if i was to total it all up that's awesome but it took a year to buy them wow they're, yeah, hard, I have- they're hard to get now <laughs> yeah i have all the 60s 70s and 80s albums individually on vinyl um, obviously the nineties and two thousand stuff's gonna be pretty hard to find, but oh like, Ian Anderson too, Jethro Tall. He yeah, yeah, oh yeah. nice, yeah. Yeah. That I guy mean, he, he makes out sound, sound great. He 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 self-produced from the beginning. Maybe. Right. Right. Well, I it, saw them live. I saw them live uh, uh Eagles opened for him in nineteen seventy two and they did all of thick as a brick. But then a passion play came out and I was just like, Oh my god, this mm. is Best thing I've ever heard in my life. I loved, loved it. Yeah. Um, I would say Frank Zappa, but I think he he was the one who to produce himself. I don't think he, you know, he he had his vision and went for the vision rather. You know, I don't. Yeah, think he wrote the he book on DIY. Other... Huh? He made the, he did everything himself. Was, the, guy, yeah. the guy was amazing. I, I can't. I never get tired of Zappa. There's some Zappa I don't like. Are we we're not recording anymore, are we? Oh, we're yeah, recording. We're, we're still going. 
Oh, I thought Marco um, said that you guys did really good. So. Oh yeah, no. He I just, says I just that. To throw that. I just wanted to throw that last uh, question out there, but uh, we're we're pretty much done. I, I think we can we can wrap up. Maybe I'll just go around and get everybody. If you want to give a very final thought and or and or a plug, um, why don't we start with you, Grant? Do you have any plugs you want to make or anybody uh, you want to say hi to? No or? plugs. This is my plug. Awesome. <laughs> I'm plugging I'll, I'll second that. Very cool. What about you, Ryan? Um, yeah, so I have a YouTube channel, Facebook, and Instagram. It's all called Ryan's Final Destination. Um, right now, I've been doing a ton of written reviews. It's my solo project. I have a ton of video content already, but from now on, I want to start having like collaborations as the videos just because I've been really enjoying writing a lot. Um, so definitely check me out there. Um, everything will be on Facebook um written wise instagram not everything can because some of the reviews are too long for their limits and stuff but so definitely check out the facebook page i'll also post any youtube links too so i guess that'd be a good place to start for you is checking out the facebook page liking it um following it whatever you want to do and just commenting too on the reviews you know i put out stuff pretty much every day and i'd love to hear you your guys' opinions on the albums as well. Awesome. Thanks, Ryan. What about you, Todd? I don't have anything to plug. Watch me on the contrarians occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> right. and there you go. Uh, I, the same for me. I hang around here. <laughs> awesome. Safer. How about you, Rand? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I have a channel on YouTube called Rand Kelly, and so do other people, but nobody's got what I've got. I do my own music on, on there. I make stuff up. I have seven synthesizers and uh, a guitar and uh, I, I just make up music as I, as I feel it. And uh, I record it and it's called take one. And I just put a title after it and I need a thousand subscribers and I'm kind of stuck at 571 or something like that. And I could use some, some more subscriptions to a thousand because then I can go live, but YouTube's got this stupid rule that if you can't get to a thousand, you can't go live. So everything I have to do is, is like this pre-recorded and then just throw it up there. But I'd sure appreciate it if I could get to a thousand. Thank awesome. you. Anybody well, I hope you'll help. make it. Yeah. Hope you'll make it to a thousand. Uh, and Joe, my man, what do you got uh, going on? I'll, be, I'll actually be on Ryan's channel. So mm -hmm. I got to put that. I actually have something to plug from myself, but I do want to, once again, Tim Burling's unspooled, if you have, if you get it, get the bundle. It man, it's it's hardcover, soft cover, bookmarks, uh, magnet. It comes in a great tote bag. It's just a fun read. It's uh, Tim's vinyl confessions. This is his YouTube channel. Tim Durling, he's here on Contrarians. But an awesome read, awesome professional bundle package. So go out and buy the book. Very cool. I second glad... that, Joe. I don't have mine here with me. It's in the other room, but yes. Yeah, I, it, I got one too. Great. Yeah. I'm very glad that worked out for him. Um, and we got the contrarian. So if you want to like and subscribe us, that'd be amazing. If you want to follow us on Patreon, you can join these conversations. We have our Ko-Fi account where you can um, donate to the channel without subscribing on a monthly basis. And we also have Tee Public as um, modeled by Grant over there in the corner. <laughs> so if you want to look as good as Grant, head over to Tee Public. The link is in the description. And uh, we'll see you all next time. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Yeah.